It's through one another, right? That's one way He loves us. And uh, I feel that right now here. I honor you for being here. Thanks for being hungry enough to come. It wasn't a sacrifice for me and Todd to come. We're honored to be here. We didn't like pay some heavy price to come here. We're not doing ministry. We're loving one another. Okay? Really. This, this isn't like some big sacrifice. This is a joy. And I didn't even catch the depth of the heart of it until I stepped up here and Bob stepped up and started sharing. And I, I just recognized, I knew there was a call on Bob's life, but I just recognized how deep it is in his heart. And I feel that right now, and I just honor that. So uh, thank God for everybody. Oh, it was... The chili that Bob made was incredible. It was truly from the above realm. <laughs> it was the best. I talked to my wife. She said, get the recipe. So because he loves me, he's going to give it to me. So, <laughs> Amen. Well, listen, guys, we're going to have fun. What, what time do I have till in this session? It's all right. I need, we need to know because there's a lot we're doing today. Is, is, I have a good hour, though. Right? I have an hour. Okay, good. Man, thanks for being here. Let's just get on with this. Okay, listen. I didn't come here to tell you what you're not and what you're not doing right. I came to tell you who you are. And I'm going to explain why real clear scripturally, okay? Because I'm pretty pumped. I'm loved by God. I'm accepted by God. The gospel has saved and changed my life forever. So I have access to Him. I have right to approach Him. I never understood that my whole life. I went to church because it was the right thing to do. I was supposed to go to church. Mom took me there. <laughs> and as I got older, I thought it was the right thing to do. But I can tell you guys that I was conscious of sin, consciousness of what was wrong in my life, and felt like I needed to change myself, and then gave up on myself and thought I could never change myself I'm just the way I am. And something died in me, and for eight years I didn't even go to church. And my impression of the gospel was that this poor fellow named Jesus came and took a whipping because I was such a bad boy or a loser or a mess up. And what he taught me in the last 15 years, guys, and what I want to cry out from the rooftop today is that the gospel doesn't point out that I'm a mess up. It points out my value. It points out that I'm created in God's image. The fact that Jesus came reveals I must have amazing value to God the Father. For anyone to pay a price so extreme, I must have an incredible root value from the beginning. So God isn't exposing just the fact that I sinned. He's removing the fact that I sinned. So that He can get to me and I can now become a son. So what I want to talk to you about for the next hour is living from that place of sonship and not letting anything else sell you short. Not letting people sell you short. Not letting excuses. Come on, we've been great excuse makers. We have a reason why we're not where we're to be. <laughs> and none of it is valid. And I'm going to just expose all that in a little bit in a good way and, and edify you in the process, okay? This isn't one of them things where I'm going to talk about all the sins that men commit and how we live and then have an altar call where we cry and leave and feel like we're going to need this again soon. Come on! The gospel's the transformation of my life. I didn't wake up this morning trying not to sin. I didn't wake up this morning trying to be a Christian. I woke up a son, created in God's image, loved by God, and forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to live from the place of righteousness every day where I'm right with God. Now guys, like, like Bob said, in the Western world, we've been, we've been hit our whole life with our ability to sin, we're always sinners, we're always going to mess up. And what it does is it keeps us from ever going close to God and getting face to face with God and feeling like we even can be alone with God in His presence. And a lot of us are constantly conscious, if I take a show of hands, constantly conscious of what's wrong with us and what needs to critique or change in our life. And that's why many of us don't stay encouraged and zealous and in love with God. But if you see His first love and you understand you've become through the cross, what it does is you begin to reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God. See, guys, we equate our ability to commit sin or our ability to live in moments of weakness to our identity. But our identity is through Christ. Come on. Nobody pays a high price for nothing. Nobody. And what was paid for you and me? The blood of Jesus. So does it expose my sin, the blood of Jesus, or forgive my sin? 
What's the blood of Jesus do, guys? Expose my sin or forgive my sin? So if my sin's forgiven, let's get it on and be sons. Let's live from Christ and not for Christ. A lot of us are trying to do Christian things, stay faithful in church, do ministry. We're living from Christ. We're living through Christ. We're not living for Him. He becomes our identity, guys. He said, follow me. He's the firstborn among many. Oh my goodness, it's so exciting to me. If my sins are forgiven, they're forgiven. I have access to God. God doesn't see me for my sins. He sees me for the blood of Jesus. He sees me for my created value. He sees me for my potential. Do you understand? I'm camping here for on purpose. We've got to rethink this thing and live from the place of the love of God and the, the righteous judgment of God where He says, stand before me and be right. Be accepted by me. Be as if you've never sinned and eaten the tree. Stand before me and be okay with that because I love you. I know where you've been. I know what you've done. But I know who you really are, who I created you to be. And that's what He's redeeming through the cross. Redemption means brought back to original value. So if God said, let us make man in our image, and man sinned and fell short of the glory of God and walked away and separated himself from fellowship and relationship with God, then everything that he became after that is what Jesus came to remove. And Jesus wants to restore us back to that which we were created for in the beginning. So I'm far from hopeless. People aren't my barometer. Hello? People are not my barometer. People don't have the power then to make you or break you because you're made by Him. The love of Christ is the fullness of God in a man. Rooted and grounded in love. See, He never said... See, us guys, we've been taught a certain thing our whole life to be a certain way. And, and He never said the macho inherit the earth. He said the meek inherit the earth. Serious. It's good to be strong and it's good to be... But, but there, there's a meekness... There's a strength in meekness. There's a strength in love that, that, that I'm concerned we haven't understood. Jesus was far from weak. But they saw him as such. He's so my hero. I just so want to follow him. It was the biggest injustice ever created, ever, ever, ever carried out on the earth was when they crucified Jesus. There couldn't be possibly more injustice than that. And all he could do is love. And all he could do is look through the heart of God. And all he could do is live from the place of who he was created to be and why he came here and why he was predestined before the foundation of the world. A lamb sent and slain. All he could say is, Father, forgive them. There's something they're not seeing. wonder if it's as simple as something we're not seeing. wonder if we can be encouraged every day. Wonder if we can live by grace. Wonder if we can do great exploits. Wonder if we can love the people that are unlovely. Wonder if we can have peace in our homes. Wonder if we can love in the midst of anything. I bet we can. Jesus said, Follow me. I want you to look at something in Genesis, okay? I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, this is a big deal to me. This is a real big deal to me. I'm going to I'm going to reiterate something I feel it in my heart to, to nail this down. God forbid we keep preaching the gospel in this country that just makes us more aware of our ability to fail. To make yourself real low isn't to lift God up. He called you up into heavenly places to sit with him in Christ Jesus. He said, if you've been raised with Christ, get your mind off the earth and set your mind on the things above where Christ is sitting. For you died, your life is now hidden in Christ. That's Colossians 3. That's what I'm quoting. So get your mind off the earth. So, so just equating our ability to sin and think to talk ourselves way low is to lift God up. That is not going to release the kingdom of God on the earth. That's not going to bring freedom to your soul. That's going to make you more aware of sin, more conscious of sin. And I promise you guys, most of us have learned this. If you wake up and try not to sin, you're conscious of sin by mid-morning. You're aware of weakness and failure in your life. 
And then you feel condemned, your prayer life dies, your fellowship with God dies, and now you're going through the religious motions trying to do what you know you should do and, and act out what you know is right, but yet you don't feel like you're doing a very good job. So you don't feel good about yourself, you feel demeaned and condemned, and yet you're called to love your neighbor as yourself and you don't even like yourself. So you start seeing others through the own dysfunction of your own identity. You all with me? What's the two greatest commandments? Love God with everything you are and love others that same way. Why? Because it's all about love. Guys, it doesn't have to sound macho. It has to sound like God. We are on the planet to love. <laughs> he made us in His image. You and me. Who knows that we're no better than women? We're no better than women. Don't think we're better than women. But I'll tell you what. We were created first in God's image and out of the fullness of God in the man. He brought forth woman. It wasn't because Adam was in need and lonely or had an erection and didn't know what to do with it. It's because he looked like God. Hello? You're all awake. You were anyway. Listen, listen, <laughs> more awake. Okay, good. <laughs> Think about this. Adam's naming all the animals. He's walking in fellowship with God. God's looking at Adam and seeing himself in the man. Christ in you. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works. We know it's the Christ in us. Let's get out of this foster man. Well, it's not me, it's God. He wants you to see yourself one with Him. He says, whatever city you're in, heal the sick there. You can argue all day with God, well, I can heal the sick. And He still says, you go heal the sick. Why? Because He's saying, when you touch, I touch. When you minister, I minister. Two have become one. Stop seeing yourself apart from me. Hello? So then we give this language, well, it's not me, brother. It's the Lord. We all know that. Of course it's the Lord. I can't even love you without God. Without God, I'm selfish and I'm all about me. But with God, I can become love and I can love you. I don't have to qualify that all the time. I get alone and weep and I know without Him I'm lost, but with Him I'm found. Do you get it? This is so good to me. It's, it changes our life. So Adam's in the garden. He's naming all the animals. How many animals are there? How many did he name? gazillions, right? It's millions, right? And he's naming them and, he, and God never corrected him. He never upstaged him. He never said, he never said, oh, Adam, come on, that's silly. You can't name it that. Everything Adam named, the animals, God said, that's awesome, boy. That is so cool. A what, a zebra? Yeah, I like it. Why? What's the picture there? The picture is God and man one. God's wisdom in the man. God allowing man to subdue the works of his hands, to govern the earth in the authority of God. Not on some tangent, some presumptuous, proudful venture. In oneness with God. He had a relationship. He didn't have a religion. Adam didn't lose religion. He lost relationship. And when he lost relationship, he lost identity. And when identity was lost, humanity was in big trouble. This whole thing about the gospel is the restoration of your and my identity. It's back to the truth of who we really are. I'm so loved by God. He so loves to love me. He is so excited to send his love. If I had a resume on God's desk, if you had a resume on God's desk and he read it, he'd say, what? This is who they, yes. Call my son. My son must die, so they must live. Because they're created to be sons. And if I give one son, I'll obtain many sons. You're not sinners saved by grace. You're sons of God. You're sons of God. Is that blasphemous? Absolutely not. The Spirit of God crying out in us, Abba, Father. If He's Abba, Father, we must be sons. The only reason it sounds difficult is because we weigh ourselves and judge ourselves according to life and our actions and our past practice. And sometimes we think every thought that goes through our mind is us. And when it violates you, it's not you. 
There's a lot of men struggling with the thoughts in their mind and it's just the past and the blast of the past trying to get outside, trying to get back in. Your heart's been changed, the gospel's touched you, truth has touched you, and now you're condemned because of something that goes through your mind. If it bothers you, it's not even you. Hello? Don't follow the stranger's voice. Don't sell out cheap when you've been bought at such a high price. Don't let something outside that isn't even you anymore. Say, psh, 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 psh. oh, why am I still fake to that? Oh, why am I still? Why did I picture that? Because there's a lying devil on the earth that's after your identity saying, this is still you. It's still in you somewhere. It's still hiding somewhere. And you're going, oh, and you're calling a brother in confidence, crying out in humility, telling him what you're thinking, crying, asking him to pray. And he's thinking, oh, it's okay, bro. And you're waiting for that to all go away. That might never go away. But knowing who you are and living from the place of truth is huge. Because then you resist him by submitting to God. You cast him down by submitting to truth. The blast of the past runs through your mind and you say, Father, I so thank you. You've changed my heart. I so thank you. You've purified me. I love you with everything in me. And I'm so honored to be a son. Holy Spirit, thank you for abiding in me. You are awesome in my life. And the whole time this thing's going, yank, 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 yank. Submit to God. Resist him. He'll flee. Stop selling out your identity and thinking everything you're thinking is you. You're just selling out every time. Come on, we know the difference between sneaking around to get away with things and living in denial and hiding and things that are just come and violating us and we wish we'd never think it again. Man, if something comes in my mind that I wish I could never think again, I already know it's not me. I don't even think twice about it. I'll never call Bob and say, man, brother, I've been thinking this. You need to pray for me. Nope, if I start thinking something like that, I lift up my voice and rejoice and declare the truth of who I am. So if that keeps speaking, I'll know all the more. If that keeps speaking, I'll be more established. If that keeps speaking, I'll know Jesus more than before. Hello? Does that make sense? Come on, we're selling out, guys, sometimes because we don't know who we are. Come on, the strength of your pure heart is the strength of your life. You can get alone with Jesus, close the door, and you can know you're not trying to miss it. You can know you didn't wake up with a plan to miss God. Come on, then when, at what point do you receive grace to just be a son and get up and not be weary, but be strong? And all of a sudden, get in communion with God and ask Holy Spirit to begin to give you understanding and make His heart your heart and His eyes your eyes and teach you firsthand the love of God. I am not just saved to go to heaven. I'm saved for heaven to come into me. I'm saved to take on a new nature, to put off an old, put on a new. You know what we sell in America all the time? Pray this prayer to go to heaven. Pray this prayer to go to heaven. And we think it's the biggest deal on the earth because men must get saved. Saved means healed, delivered, protected, preserved, made whole, and kept safe and sound. It doesn't mean pray a prayer to get your name in a book and one day a bus is going to pick you up. What it means is getting converted, getting born again. Transformation of life. It's hard to preach this in this country because we've so drilled the prayer, the sinner prayer. We've so drilled that thing that when you talk this way, it's like, oh my God, that's blasphemy. We want souls. We need souls saved. You must be born again. We need to put on the old, put on the new. We're being brought back to original value. We are not praying a prayer to go to heaven. We're getting back to God and He's eternal and we'll live forever. Yes, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to live forever. New heaven, new earth. That's not why I'm born again. I didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. I got right with God and heaven came back into me and I have a relationship with Papa. Come on, you can pray a prayer to go to heaven and stay self-centered, self-serving. Still let people eat your lunch and be the barometer of your day and you're under the jurisdiction of life and life either makes you or breaks you and yet you sing Jesus as Lord. You all all right? It's talking to him. Can I talk heart to heart like this? You all okay? I'm not. There ain't a mean bone in my body, man. I, my lunch was being eaten. I was 33 years old, deceived, hard hearted, hypocritical, saying all the right things and living all the wrong things. I was in a desperate place and Jesus came and rescued me. The mercy of God snatched me out of that place and showed me I'm a son. In the face of hypocrisy, he showed me I was a son. In the face of selfishness, he showed me I was still a son. I just didn't see that. I was trying to change me and line up and do that. And I gave up long ago. And Jesus didn't give up. I see where you've been. I know what you've done. But I know who you are, boy. And I love you. Boy, if he can ever reveal that to me, it's on now, right? 
Because now I'm receiving the love of God, the mercy of God. I'm not even thinking sin. I'm not even thinking that stuff. My ability to fail. I'm thinking His ability to keep me. I'm leaving these doors today, a righteous child of God. And if I live righteous, I'll produce its fruit, Romans 6, unto holiness. I present my members as righteousness unto God. Why? Because of His incredible mercy and grace that saved me. It's not a presumptuous decree. It's not my bright idea. It's the message of the cross. He's saying this about us. He's bringing us back to the garden where he looked into Adam and saw himself. Who is God's image? Well, God's a lot of things. But what is he in the Bible? What, is, what do we know God as? God is love. So he puts himself in the man and fills the man with all that he is. And out of that fullness and out of that place, he sees him naming all the animals. They're walking in agreement. They're walking in oneness. Adam's flowing in his identity. And he says, man, there's none comparable to this guy. It's not good he'd be alone. Why? Because he's lonely? No, because love is profuse and has to multiply. It needs an outlet to minister and manifest. He didn't make woman because man was lonely. He made woman because he was filled with God. And woman's created value is to receive the pure, amazing, pure love of God through a covenant man that will love her in Christ Jesus like Christ loves the church. I can get on that a little, but I don't know that I'm necessarily supposed to go there. But I'll tell you what, my manhood was all chopped up. I, I got my manhood identity in the locker room, uh, 11 years old on the train tracks, finding a pornographic magazine, sitting on the, on the dock and on a Sunday when it was closed, reading it on pornographic. And that was my education. My manhood was taught to me by the world. What it was to be a man, I received through the world. And when Jesus saved me, I realized that's a lie. It's all about me. It's a drive. It's self-centered, self-serving. I don't even have the ability to love. Love isn't selfish. And, and I fell on my knees, guys, and I cried out. And I'm just challenging you. If any of you feel like you're, you're bound in an area like that, I'm not having an altar call. I'm telling you, you can, you can break covenant with a wrong identity. You can say, I've been deceived. I thought this was what it was to be a man and I liked this and I held on to this, but you couldn't have made me this way because it's at the cost of someone. And if you ever get quiet and close your bedroom door and face those things and get on your knees with Jesus, all our lives will change through relationship. It's not just an order call. It's not just preaching and crying and saying, okay, we're going to try better now. It's getting alone with Abba Father. It's getting alone with Daddy God and getting real from your heart with Him and allowing Him to come and transform us back into His image. God, I've embraced a lie. You got a little addiction in your life. You got a little thing in your life that you just can't stop because you gave it power. You fed that thing and now it grabbed you and it's holding on to you. I'm not here to preach all those things that they could be. I'm telling you good news. You can get alone in the secret place and seek Him there and He will see you there. And when you close the door and get real with God and say, God, I gave myself to this. I know it's not edifying me. I know it's not releasing your purpose. And I know in the long run it's graying me out and hurting my soul. And I'm telling you, I've become a prisoner of this thing, but I declare you the Lord in Christ and I thank you for breaking every chain. I thank you for loving me because my heart doesn't desire to be bound. My heart desires to be in you. And you start communing like that with Jesus in your secret place, in the, in the lifestyle of relationship, your whole world will change. Your whole world will change. He came over me and broke that stronghold of manhood and all that stuff. And I started realizing what love was, that love isn't selfish. Love isn't at the cost of others. Did you ever get this? You and I, from the time we were born, we were in survival mode, trying to fit in, pecking order, trying to get people to like us, not dislike us, accept us, not drink. We all just needed someone to love us. Come on, as manly as we seemed, we really needed someone to care and love us, right? Well, God's the source of love. Watch this. We're created in His image. We're created to be loved. Watch the perversion of the fall. In the beginning, we were created to love. Through the fall, we need everyone to love us. Hello? We psychologically accept that in the church today. The way that seems right to man is laced all through our thinking. And even pastors will stand and say, well, yeah, everybody needs love, brother. Yeah, the source of love is God. To know the love of Christ is to be filled with all the fullness of God. Is it wrong for people to love you? Absolutely not. It's awesome when people love you. But it's not the mandate. The mandate is to love, to become love. Oh, no man anything but to love. If I put expectation on Bob, I set Bob up to fail and disappoint me. And his identity to fail in my sight. But if I love Bob, everything's cool. Because he owes me nothing. 
If I expect of him, he's my barometer. He can potentially change me, make me or break me. Why would I give this man that much power when, it, when I'm created in God's image to love Bob? And Bob has that same potential. Hello? Come on, this is powerful. See, we all grew up needing love. We were born into the fall. God didn't make us that way. We became that way. Self-centered. That's why I turned you to Genesis. I didn't forget. We're going there. Selfish. Self-centered. See, when man was created, he was created in God's image and God is love. Selfishness is a 180 degree twist. It's the flip side of the coin. There's no selfishness in love, no love in selfishness. So did man just sin in the garden or did he take on the nature of the enemy of God? Did he actually become like the enemy, driven like the enemy? Come on, God spoke out about Job and Satan got right back in God's face and said, well, the only reason Job's like that is because you bless him. He only loves you because you appear to love him. He only blesses you because you appear to bless him. Come on, you know every man's all about himself. Every man loves himself. Stretch forth your hand and take the blessing. He'll curse you like any man because people don't love you, God. They love themselves. That's what he was saying. And he believes that about every one of us. He's not impressed with our worship today. He's not impressed. He, he's not impressed because he believes when you get outside of a place like this, it's just another service, he's going to poke you, squeeze you, and find that you're still about you. And then he's going to whisper condemnation and get you in the secret beat down place. And you're going to find yourself like a Christian robot trying to do all the outward things, dying on the inside. And that's a lie from hell. You follow me? It's a lie from hell. He believes, wonder if I can love God more than my own life. Wonder if you cannot love your own life unto death and overcome the enemy. I bet you can if it's in the scripture. I bet people don't have to make you or break you. I bet you can love people come hell or high water. I bet in the secret place God will take his heart and mold it into yours. I bet you'll take his eyes and take them and look right through your soul. I bet if you see your value, you'll see others' value. I bet you if you start to like who you are through Christ, you'll see the potential of Christ in every man. I bet you won't matter how they're acting or what they're saying, you'll realize, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they see, and you'll keep shining light into the situation because light removes darkness. You don't have to tell somebody why they need to change. You show them the truth about that change. You get it? Now we, if we're not careful, have a lot of reasons why we're not living what I'm preaching, and then we're letting people be the jurisdiction of our life. All of a sudden, people are molding and shaping us instead of the gospel. But the reason we sing He's our everything, the reason, Pastor Corey, we would sing He's our everything is why? Because without Him, we have no identity. We have no purpose. We have no longevity. We have no existence. Jesus is my everything, not because He meets all my needs and answers my prayer, because all things were created through Him, and by Him all things exist. So when I see Him, I see myself. I find out who I really am through Christ. I find me. Do you get it? Come on, it's a big deal. We're not doing religious duty. We're not, well, I know I ought to, brother. I know I shouldn't. Well, I really want to, but I shouldn't. Come on, that is religious, traditional, dry, no life. That's just, ah, I don't even, my whole life has changed. I'm not even pulled by stuff like I used to be. It's just died in the beauty of who he is. In the glory of what I've seen he's done in my own heart. I'm not pulled and tugged like we think we all have to be. And I don't have a demon and I'm not in denial. I'm not pulled by all that stuff anymore. Why? Because my eyes are fixed on him. Righteousness has consumed me. And you produce your fruit unto holiness. If you believe you're a son, you start living like a son. If you believe you're right with God, you'll manifest right with God. Guilt, condemnation, shame, tools of the devil, and Christians are burdened with them, especially men of God. Men of God, they put on this outward posterior, and inside it's not the reality. And you all have access to Him. You all have access to the love of the Father. You can all chin up because He knows who you are and loves you. You can look at Him and behold His face. Every one of us can, because of the blood of Jesus crying mercy on our behalf. Satan fears the day we look into his face. Satan fears the day we get free from ourselves. You heard Todd, if you were there last night, he said, I'm free from me. We preach it all the time. What are we free from? Just the power of sin? No, the power of sin is self-centered, self-serving living. I'm free from me. And if I'm really free from me, I'm free from you. The proof of being free from me is when I'm free from you. Because <laughs> if I'm not free from you, then I'm still very much alive. Now, what did Jesus say? If any man come after me, let him first deny. 
Why? You were never created for you. You were created for the image of God. So you're not praying a prayer to go to heaven. It's the transformation of life. You're being born again because the first time around was in Adam and the second time is in Christ and two become one. We ought to preach the gospel clear. We make it all about a prayer to go to heaven. It's about a transformed life. That's why water baptism has almost slipped out of the church. We pray prayers with people all the time to go to heaven and don't even mention water baptism. In the book of Acts, you can't even find it not preached. Everywhere they got saved, they got baptized immediately. Why? Because it was the expression of old things dead, new things alive. Dying in the likeness of his death, raising in the newness of life, raising in the power of his resurrection. Not congratulations, your name's now in the book. No, it's a transformed nature. Look, I was living for myself, and now I die to myself. I was living at the cost of everyone around me that I say I love, and they are not my excuse. Glory to God, the truth has come. Now I'm becoming love. I'm not blaming anything on my spouse. I'm not blaming anything on my kids. I have a responsibility in my life to respond to truth. I will answer to Christ. I will stand there. And it'll be a sad day if you say, well, I'd have been this if it wasn't for my wife. How lame will that sound? And then Jesus says, well, what about me? What? So she's not Lord. And if she's living a certain way that's grieving you, it ought to grieve you in mercy for her sake not give you the reason to have a hard heart and a chip on your shoulder and a right to be less than Christ? Why do we let people give us the right to be less than Christ? Hello. Come on, I preach this way to me all the time, so I'm going to preach to you this way. (laughs) I don't need an excuse to miss Him. Okay? And I'm not being mean right now. Feeling sorry for ourselves and justifying our lives apart from truth is one of the greatest deceptions we give ourselves to. We start feeling sorry for me, and then we prove to the enemy it is all about me, and then you're a sitting duck. You've got bullseyes all over your body or your spirit. It's, you're just an easy target. If you ever reveal it's all about you, you're already toast. He'll just... Well, everything go wrong with me. Well, why does everybody mistreat me? Well, why can't everybody... Well, why don't they... Me, me, me. It's all deception. Man, if Jesus embraced that mindset, he'd have been done the first day he stepped out in ministry because they tried to push him off a cliff and kill him. It'd be like Pastor Corey debut and on the, from the pulpit, you know, and they all right gather. Man, how'd it go, brother? What's up? Well, I think I sowed some seed. I mean, they were pretty hostile. They, they tried to kill me, but I slipped away. They what? Yeah, I'm going to pray and go at it next week again. You, most, if they try to kill you, if you go preach and they start throwing Bibles at you and screaming and throwing hymnals and calling you a heretic and trying to kill you, you wouldn't feel real encouraged. But Jesus knew that he was loving people. He saw blindness. He knew his heart was pure. And, and yet they didn't esteem him. He came to his own. They received him not. He didn't entrust himself to men because he knew what was in men. He had no need to entrust himself and have man bear witness of him. He knew who he was in the Father and it gave him the power to love those very men. Not depend on them, love them. I know we preach good sermons about depending on one another and being there for one another. That's all of our place. We ought to all take responsibility for that in Christ. But if I depend that of you, I'm going to be disappointed at some point along the way. And if I'm not careful, I'm going to give myself permission to be less than what grace is telling me I am. You follow me? I'm saying this for the third time. It just feels right to say it again. I can't let you be the reason for my life. You ought to have the permission to sharpen me, edify me, encourage me, and speak life into me. But you should never have the permission to chip away or cut away or tear down what only Christ can give. We should sharpen one another. I should be able to encourage Bob, but I should never have the ability to cut him down. He he shouldn't even give me that right because of who he is in Christ and he loves me. Come on, you don't always hear this preached, but if you listen, you can hear it's healthy. Because we the way that seems right to man, we've we've laced a lot of human wisdom through the gospel. And we understand what we're saying, but the gospel doesn't. And the life of Jesus doesn't. Because He's our example, isn't He? Wasn't He the living epistle of love? Didn't He say, follow me? Doesn't the Bible say, be imitators of God, walk in love as dear children, and follow Jesus who gave Himself up, a sweet fragrant aroma to God? Come on. I've found that spouses pray for each other Because they know if God touches their spouse, they'll have a better day in life. No wonder prayers never get answered that way hardly. 
that doesn't even leave your ceiling. It's a self-serving prayer. We've lost the value of one another because we're living at the cost of one another. It's the biggest detriment to our lives, guys. Letting people determine who you are. Jesus is amazing. All them things we sang today are true. And if you'll ever see them from a personal place, nobody will ever stop the song that's in your heart. It doesn't even have to be a set worship time. The song is singing in your heart because you're alive unto Him. <laughs> it's a big deal. I'll take you to Genesis. I won't hold you off no more. I just felt like some things rose up and I've still been talking, so. Verse 26 of Genesis 1. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. He gave him dominion over the fish and, and the birds and over everything. Verse 27. So God created man and in his own image and in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Isn't that amazing? I'm not going to go through the whole story just for the sake of time. I think most of you know this. But even in, in chapter 2, he talks about uh, actually creating man and then woman. It's, it's just amazing. Down through the end of chapter 2, out of the fullness of God, Adam comes up out. Look at verse 23 of chapter 2. Man, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. You know, you hear preachers say, whoa, man. <laughs> because she was taken where? Out of man. She wasn't another lump of clay. She wasn't another lump of clay. She was, God and man and woman were all one in the heart of God from the beginning. He saw them before they were seen. He, he created man. He breathed into him the life of God. And out of that life, he brought forth woman. He didn't even make another lump of clay. It was out of the man. So out of God and the man, he multiplied himself. That's why two becoming one is synergistic. It's Because so, it's two wills. It's two souls. It's two mindsets yielding to truth and becoming one. And it's greatly powerful. That's why unity is such a big deal. It's in our great diversity we can find a common place. In our great diversity of gifts and callings. Man, I can't sing like Todd. I can't sing like Corey. I sure can't play like that. And, and I can't do certain things. I don't have certain gifts of pulling things together in administration like Bob probably has. I, I don't have some of the things you have. But you might not have some of the things I have. So in our great diversity we find true unity when we all live for the same reason. To look like Him. To manifest His glory. We're not trying to build our own kingdoms. Manifest kingdoms. Build churches. Have successful ministry. We are manifesting Jesus Christ in us. We're all living for the image of God to be revealed. It should be our goal so that the kingdom of God can come on the earth as it is in heaven. So in our great diversity, in our, you know, our call to the mission field, our call to men, our call to minister to children, all those different things, it's, it's in that great diversity we find true unity when we all live for the same common goal. It's the beauty. It's not uniformity. That's what Hitler was trying to do. Remember how he lined them all up and looked alike and they're all marching in uniformity? That's far from unity. Getting everybody to look the same, talk the same, act the same isn't what Jesus is after. Just living for the same purpose and goal. To manifest Jesus everywhere you are. To walk in love and become like Him. Come on. Out of the fullness of God and the man, He made the woman. He took woman and, and Adam said, this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Sounds pretty intimate, huh? Therefore man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one. I'm going to make a long story short because there's so much to preach there. But I want you to skip down through chapter 3. Who isn't aware that, who isn't aware of the story? And be honest if you're not. It doesn't make you unspiritual. Who's not completely aware of the story of Adam being deceived by the serpent and eating the fruit and Adam following her? Is there anyone that wants to look at that or need? Is everybody on page with me on that? We all good? You all know that? Okay. Remember how he said about naked? I saw I was naked. I heard you coming in the garden and I ran. It's total sin consciousness. It's a picture of sin consciousness. See, I, I wasn't even knowing I was going to Genesis, but we, that came up and I felt like, wow, we talked a little about something yesterday in Genesis. But then that came up and I thought, wow, this is so good. Here's man in relationship with God. He is right standing with God. God so much sees Himself in that man that out of that He makes a woman and two become one. This is deep. And all of a sudden, sin comes in the picture, the consciousness of sin, and the very one He was creating an image like, He got afraid and ran from and felt naked and ashamed and exposed. Sin consciousness is detrimental to your life. You can find in the next chapter... Uh, at the end, before chapter 4, I mean at the end of chapter 3, where after he talked to them, and we can look at it, but he took off their fig leaves. God 
stripped them down, took off their fig leaves, and put on animal skins. Now, we know, and pastors preach and know and understand that that's the first sign of blood atonement, blood covenant, blood atonement, something had to die to cover them. We understand that. But to me, it's just as much a sign of righteousness. Because if they wear those fig leaves, they remain conscious of the day they miss God and the conscious of their sin. If they're wearing what God clothed them with, they're aware that there's hope and a promise and a future and a God that loves them in spite of their mistake. That's powerful. You don't want to wake every day looking at your fig leaves and regretting the day you messed up. You want to wake up looking at the garment of righteousness knowing the day that God saw past your weakness and infused you with strength. Do you get it? So it's right there in your Bible. He was prophetically pointing to the day men would be in Christ Jesus. See, and Todd said it last night, and it's funny because we, we, just, we, just, we have a ball with this. Uh, I'm a bride. I'm wearing a dress. I look like so good to Jesus. He wants to marry me, and that's not weird. It's a spiritual union. Okay? I look good in my wedding dress to him. It's called the robe of righteousness, the garment of salvation. You can see in Matthew, a man came in and he said, where are your wedding clothes? Boy, you ought to wear them and rejoice. <laughs> I wake up and look good to him. Why? Because I look clean and pure and spotless a bride. Isn't that cool? That's not weird. It's not flaky. It's a spiritual truth that makes me one with Him. He sees me apart from my ability to fail. He sees me for the potential of what He created me in, and then I love Him all the more. I receive grace all the more. I honor Him all the more. That's what it means to receive the first love of God, that in spite of you, He comes and loves you because He knows His grace can make you greater. His grace can form you and mold you. If you just see yourself through yourself, you won't receive something such good news as this. Do we deserve it? No, not based on our actions. Do we deserve it based on our created value? To God. He's not a fool to send His Son. He knows who He bought. He knows what He purchased. Please hear me. I'm saying this about the fifth time now. Don't let the gospel be the exposure of your sin. Let it be the forgiveness of your sin. Let the gospel be the revealing of your potential and your value. The gospel speaks to me that I'm worth something to God. So if I believe that, I'll start living that. And I'll get off a pity trip, a self-sorrow thing, and I won't let you be the excuse of anything less than Him. You get it? Okay. I said that about five times now on purpose, okay? Not to be redundant, not because I don't have anything else to preach. I'm zeroing in on something, okay? I'm trying to stay real zeroed in here because I feel like God wants to nail that down. Where are we at? About 15 minutes or so. Watch this. The eyes of them in verse 7 of 3 were opened. They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, made coverings. They heard the sound. This is tragic to me. It happens today. People get so close, but stay so far away. They're in all the right atmospheres, all the right places. Do you know you can have a Christian screensaver, a Christian ringtone, Christian music playing in the background, and you can have angel satellite TV with all Christian stations and never make communion and face-to-face -face contact with God? You can wear Christian and never actually have intimacy with God. You can do everything outwardly and never inwardly from your heart have communion with Him because you feel not real close to Him. And all of a sudden, He's a God way out there somewhere when He's right on the inside of you. Countless times a day, Daddy, I thank You for loving me. Father, You're so amazing to me. I thank You. I stand righteous in Your sight and You're my Father. Thank You for teaching me truth and loving me and cuddling me. I appreciate You. Thanks, I'm the desire of Your heart. You say, well, that is not, that, that, that ain't me, brother. That's you to God. <laughs> See, don't, don't let yourself be stereotyped the way I was and the way growing up, and this is my disposition, and this is my... You might be amazed who we are in Christ. <laughs> don't lock yourself out when God's saying, come in. Don't say, well, that's not me, brother. No, that's probably not you before Him. Serious, and I'm not trying to say everybody needs to be the same way, but I'm saying I, I meet people that say, well, I'm just not loud, and well, I'm just not like that. Well, well you, you're stereotyping your life. It's the way you've always been, but enter in Christ, things change. If you ever get a revelation, you're ever alone. I know some people act different than others in times, and some get more wild than others, but there's a place for joy in this gospel. There's a place to shout. There's a place to just be alone with your bedroom. You might never shout in front of people. There's a place to say, you're amazing! 
Because He overwhelms you. My Bible says it's good tidings of great joy. So you can fight the joy all you want. It just means you're not seeing the good tidings. If you're not understanding the great joy, it's because you're not seeing the good tidings because the good tidings are great joy. That's what's wrong with me. It's good tidings. <laughs> so it brought great joy. And I'm like, I suppress what I feel on the inside so I can make sense and relate because I don't want to scare people. But I'm a hundred more times on the inside than I'm coming across. I'm serious. I've been saved 15 years and this thing hasn't fallen off me. I'm more in love now than I've ever been. The next time you see me, I'll be a little more passionate, probably because I'll know him a little bit more. Do you get it? And here's the beauty. The more I know him and the more I see him, the more I see who I am. I realize Jesus reveals the Father to me, but Jesus also reveals who I am to the Father. Because he's firstborn among many. I'm predestined, Romans 8, to be conformed to the image of his Son. And he called me. He predestined me. He called me. He justified me. Who he justified, he glorified. <gasps> Blasphemy. Are you kidding me? He put the same spirit in us that raised Christ from the dead. We ought to be okay with that. He chose me. He wants to live here. He can live in a big castle in the sky and everybody can see it at once and come out and go, whoa. But he doesn't want that. He wants to live in you so people look at you and go, whoa. Because we're the ones created in His image, not the castle. The castle isn't a dwelling place for the Lord. You are. We're the temple of God. Come on, this is real. And if you understand that, you'll do justice to that truth. And you won't even try to bite your lip and live a certain way. Like, I, I, guys, the last thing I think about is sin. And the next to the last thing I think about is the devil. If he shows up, we deal with him. But I'll tell you what, he's a withered cut off branch, come into nothing, my eyes are on Jesus. I'm not troubleshooting, trouble conscious, introspective, coming out with a negative resume. I'm looking into the Word of God, into the face of Jesus with an unveiled face, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord. I'm His choice, His desire, the affection of His heart, and He paid the highest price possible to obtain me. I must be something to God. Come on, if you really believe that and get alone and accept that in a place of prayer and that becomes your reality, it'll change the functions of your life and you won't try not to sin. You're not even thinking sin. And if I do stumble along the way, I run to God because the last thing I'm thinking is stumbling. I sit on His lap. I confess that this is so less than who you created to be. It's not me. It's not you. Thanks for your love. Thanks for your mercy. He washes me. He's faithful to forgive me and cleanse me and wash me of all unrighteousness. So why? I remain righteous 24-7. I'm a child of God. You understand? We've made this thing sin so huge, such a monster. Come on, Satan's a snake cursed in the garden. In Revelation, he's a seven-headed monster rising out of the sea. Where did he get that power? We've honored him, we've preached about him, we've talked about him, we've feared him, and we made a cursed little snake into a seven-headed dragon. God didn't give him the power, men did, because they honored him from their heart and soul. And he's a liar from the beginning. Keep him where he belongs. You're not the worm in the dirt. On your belly you shall crawl all the days of your life and eat the dust of the earth. And now he wants to take that identity and put it on you. He wants you hopeless. He wants you full of fear. He wants you bitter, you enraged. He wants to reproduce himself again and again after his own kind. But the DNA of God the Father's in you. And God wants to reproduce himself in you. You are winners. You are the children of Almighty God. You get it? And here we are fighting this war with sin when Jesus already destroyed it. My Bible says He cursed sin in the flesh and sin shall have no dominion over you. You're under grace and not the law. Anybody that's worth their grain of salt and understands with purity what He's saying isn't finding a way to sin and get away with it. They found a way to be free from it. You follow me? Sin is not my dilemma. Oh, it's awesome. Jesus is Lord. Do you get it? He loves me. Your whole desire life will change, guys, when you receive. And I'm not saying that it is, and I'm not comparing me to you. What I'm saying is, in what I'm preaching, it's the answer to walking holy and clean before God. Because how do you wake up and try to be holy? You wake up and be sons, accepted in the beloved. Not trying to be, you are. 
you wake up His. You wake up forgiven. You wake up free. In the gospel, you have to be before you can ever do. Most of us are trying to do to affirm what we are. No, you're His workmanship created in Christ then for good works. You be to do. You don't do to be. One is works and religion. The other one is saved by grace through faith. I'm a child of God. I'm righteous and redeemed and forgiven. So guess what the fruit of my life is? Righteous. Because I'm a righteous tree. You don't identify an apple tree. When you plant an apple tree, you already know it's an apple tree. You're expecting it to bear apples. The apple tree isn't surprised when it bears apples. And neither are you. Right? But you know them by their fruit. So there's a place where your identity leads into fruit bearing. So I have to see that I'm righteous. The righteousness, the planning of the Lord. Trees of righteousness, the planning of the Lord that He might be glorified. So it's all to His glory. It all speaks on His behalf and to His great name. But what am I? I'm a righteous tree. Well, what's a righteous tree produce? Fruits of righteousness. Righteous in the sense of righteousness means I'm right with God. What's the fruit of righteousness? Any manifestation of the nature or attribute of God. The character and nature of God revealed through your life is the fruit of righteousness. It's the, it's the working of righteousness. And that's your destiny. If God says to bear the fruit of righteousness, it must be possible to bear witness to His image. It must be possible to love and show mercy and find grace. Right? Oh, what a place to live. What a free place. Frustration, anger, wrath, malice. What a bummer. It's not how we were made. It's what we became. Remember? You know, Satan's decree is I'll live on the, I'll sit on the highest throne, I'll be God. That's what got him kicked out of heaven. Well, the throne is the highest place. Your soul is the highest place. Your, your soul is the throne of man. It's the highest place in your body. It's where you live from. He believes he can set up camp there and rule from the souls of men and still be God in their minds. And he rules with guilt, condemnation, shame, false identity, lies, deception. Getting you fixed on something that's so wrong that it makes you right at the cost of righteousness. Did you hear what I just said? Getting your eyes so fixed on what's wrong that it makes you right at the cost of Him. That's not how God sees our life. Because if He saw us that way, we're way wrong, He's way right, and we're finished. He judged us in righteousness, not rightness. Wrong, right. You don't see somebody doing something and say, well, and then let that give you permission to be less than Christ. That's, that's not righteous judgment. I've got to show you this one thing about Adam before I close. Oh, i still got about 10 minutes. I, 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 need, I need to... Yeah, let me do that quick. And there's one more thing I want to tie up, and then we're going to stand and pray. Is that okay? Yeah. You all getting fed out of this? And you don't have to cheer, cheer or clap, but you, you, what I'm saying is, are you hearing what I'm crying out of my heart? Man, God wants you living from the place of grace and freedom. Stop trying so hard. Just be His boy. Just be His beloved. Just be His. You see what I mean? You just be. And if you be, you begin to step into your doing. If you're doing to affirm what you are, you're going to sure prove to yourself in your weakness that you failed. You're a failure. You can't. You'll never get it right. Been there, did that. Try the gospel. Don't work me. If it's one or God even loves me. Yeah. Man. I'm telling you, we used to be ruled by sin, but the gospel forgives us of sin, and all of a sudden the stronghold and power of it is destroyed, and it stops the consciousness of sin. I could show you in Hebrews where the first covenant was bulls and goats in every day, and if it was powerful enough to, to take away sin, they'd have had no more consciousness of sin, but in no way, it said, did it make the worshipers perfected before God. And then it talks about Jesus coming to do God's will, and it says in saying that He came to do a will, He takes away the first to bring forth the second. Hebrews 10. And then it talks about Him through one sacrifice for sins, perfecting forever. You're perfected forever. Who, me? Yep, because He judges you in righteousness. You're perfected forever. Sin is moved away so He can get to the real you and begin to work from there in a sanctifying power. It says you are perfected through one sacrifice. Those who are being sanctified are perfected. Well, that's blasphemy. No, it's Hebrews chapter 10. <laughs> You're perfected forever. You've got to live from that place. I'm, I'm not on eggshells. I'm in the Christ. Now you can tell by my passion that doesn't give me a looseness to live. It gives me a sincerity of heart. It builds integrity in me. It builds honor in me towards God. 
The last thing I want to do is even think of missing God. But that's not the stronghold of my life. The stronghold of my life is the fact that he loves me and I'm his son. But in my heart, the last thing I want to do is miss God. So if I stumble along the way, I told you, we just confess it. He cleans me up. I'm sharper, wiser, smarter, and more in love than I was before I missed it. You get it? The only other scenario is the garden and you're running hiding in fig leaves. Well, that didn't work for them. Why do you think it'll work for you? God didn't leave it on them. He put on robes. He put on skins. He clothed them. Why don't you stay clothed, right? Guilt says I'm not forgiven. Condemnation says I'm worthy of judgment. And shame says it's still who I am. Serious, serious tools of the devil. God did not send His Son to condemn the world. He shined the light to expose and remove darkness. Yay. Arise, shine, church. Your light's come. You get it? I want you to see this one thing way back in the beginning that I wanted to nail down, and then I'm, I'm going to close. They heard the sound of the Lord walking, verse 8, chapter 3 in the garden, in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. And the Lord called to Adam and said, Where are you? We all know he knows where he was. He's giving him a chance to respond. The fact that God came down knowing what they did shows he's a covenant God. He came to make peace. He came to make restitution. He came to prophesy and promise. If God was like we tend to think, he'd have never came down. He'd have just left them alone and depraved. But through all this and through the weakness of man, he's revealing his incredible strength and his incredible love. God's amazing. He's a father. You know, there's a lot of father talk on the earth right now, and I'm not saying I disagree with it. There's a ton of emphasis on households and fathers and a lack of fathers in it. And if we're not careful, we're actually giving the young people permission to be certain ways because they look at their fathers and say, yeah, that's my dad. I'm not so sure that the father thing should be the issue. I wonder if we should be teaching ourselves how to be sons if he's the father. I wonder if there's a lack of sonship I wonder if that's just as important as lack of natural father. I wonder if younger generation needs to be taught and we need to be taught what it means to be sons. I wonder if because of the lack of fathers, we never really knew how to be sons. And now we've got this amazing father. So see, I'm not sure that we always focus on the right things because we have the amazing father God. Why would you relate your father to him when he sent his son to die for you and all you remember about yours is this and that and it gives you permission to be hurt? No, I have permission to be free. I'm released from the alcoholism of my dad and all the words he spoke of me. I don't need ministry. I don't need somebody praying over me. The fact that God sent his son shows the truth about me. It just reveals that dad didn't understand and was hurt and he needed the same gospel. Amen. That's simple. Let it die where it belongs. Don't make much of it and give it permission for you to still track after this now that Christ has come. It's a new day. The light has come. The truth about you is revealed in him. He snatched you out of darkness into the light. Come on, if we're not careful, I'm going to talk plain. Can I, can I be man to man right now? If we're not careful, there'll be excuses to not live by faith. There'll be excuses to not live by the word of God. And I'm not being insensitive. At some point, we've got to face this. Look what Adam did. This is amazing what Adam did. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Whoa, man. Right? Now he sins. He follows. What did he do? He followed his wife instead of God. We're going to look at that real quick, and, and, and I promise we'll be done here in five minutes. Am I okay? Time? Adam, where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He had relationship. He was one with the Father. He's walking through the garden naming all the animals, and God's saying, you're amazing, Adam. Yeah, that's cool. I like that name. Good boy. Awesome. Oh, what a son. Now, he's naked, ashamed, afraid. Ooh, the peril of sin, sin consciousness. Watch. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Who knows that's a yes or no question. Did you eat from the tree, Adam? Oh, yeah. Or, no. Because it's one or the other. Either in the sin nature, you lie. No. Or, yeah. But that's not what he did. He said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree, and I ate. What's he saying? 
It was the woman you gave me. If you wouldn't have gave me the woman, I probably would have ate the tree. Hey, lighten up, get off my back. It's not me. Way back when that was written, thousands of years ago, here this is when that happened. It was written several thousand years ago, but when it happened, it was a long time ago, you can see that peril today. And you tell me the Bible isn't true? It's the effect of sin. Self-conscious, self-centered, self-preserving, self-defending. If any man come after me, let him first deny. You can't let people or God be the excuse for your life. You can't blame shift nothing. You walk before the Lord. You don't say the devil made me do it or, well, they weren't and what do you expect and put yourself in my shoes and how would you feel? That's false justification. That's what they make talk shows out of nowadays. And it's tragic because they're promoting rightness. Wrong, right, audience decide. Serious. And we've lost the ability to love. And we promote the fall of man and the sin nature. All these talk shows that are on right now, they take ta tragic, terrible situations that we should cry over. And people in the audience get vehement and get caught in emotionally and find identity and judging and, and ruling. And What a misuse of our authority and our God-given created nature and value. And people are into that stuff, man. God forbid, is the woman you gave me. If you wouldn't have gave me the woman, I probably wouldn't have the tree. Long answer, guys. Yeah, you know what? I did. God, forgive me. I followed flesh instead of the word of the Lord. I followed after weakness instead of your strength. God, have mercy on me. That would have been a better answer, right? Yeah. Something I feel like I'm supposed to look at here. Then he said, verse 17, then he said to Adam, verse 17 of chapter 3, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. What was his, what was his judgment? You followed after flesh instead of me. You live by the flesh instead of your spirit. You heeded the voice of your wife instead of the voice of the Lord. You've allowed flesh to dictate and determine your life. You've allowed something outside of me to determine who you are. Come on, this is serious. And because you've done that, you've eaten this tree which I commanded you not. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil shall eat of it all the days of your life, the thorns and thistles. Of it, doesn't this sound like, look at this, you shall eat of the herb of the field, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread to return to the ground, etc. For out of it you've taken dust, you shall go. Does that sound familiar in 2010? A lot of Christians' lives still living under that? Because they're allowing their life to be identified through flesh and dictating their identity through flesh instead of the word of the Lord. Satan has scammed us into following after the voice of flesh and human wisdom instead of the truth that resounds through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So even though we're Christians, we don't have much joy. Even though we're Christians, by the sweat of our brow, we're making it. We're worried all night in prayer and we call that faith and we're in fear and, and, and we're still pressured and all these things. And, and it's all because we're following after a wisdom less than truth. It's the wisdom of the world. The truth about you sitting in Christ. Does that make sense what I'm saying right now? So we're still feeling the feel of that curse over him for following flesh even though Christ died and rose again and we actually have resurrection life. Did you get it? So stress and striving and frustration and tit for tat and he said, she said, it all died when we died with him. Did you get it? I'm going to quote one verse. We're going to stand and pray, okay? Paul says this. And then we're just going to pray together corporately and we're going to break whatever you guys got planned here. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5. It's amazing to me what he said. He said, the love of Christ is what compels me. He's not motivated just to fulfill his calling or, hey, I got to do ministry or, well, you know, I ought to do right, brother. Well, Jesus wants me to love everybody. I'm going to love you because I'm supposed to. The love of Christ compels me. The love Christ revealed to me. The love Christ expressed towards me compels me and towards humanity because I judge something. 2 Corinthians 5. I judge this. Listen carefully. If one died, all died. If one died for all, then all what? And if we live, because of him that died, then we ought to never again live for ourselves, but him that died, 
And therefore, no longer do we judge any man any longer according to the flesh. What's he saying? Now that we see our potential and our purpose in Christ and our value from God to us, and we live because of that, now we no longer see men less than that. We see men for that same value, potential, and purpose. Come on, that's deep. I'm compelled by this love because if he died for all, then all died. And if we live because he died, we ought to not live for ourselves, but him that died. And therefore, we judge no man any longer because of this truth according to the flesh. Isn't that amazing? So no matter what men are saying or doing in your life, our response is they don't see who they are. Todd said this years ago to somebody who was hurting, if they were filled with Holy Spirit and filled with God, would they act like they're acting and say what they're saying and do what they're doing? And the person said, no. He said, then we ought to have mercy on them because they're missing truth. They're not your problem. We're not fighting flesh and blood. You get it? Why don't you stand to your feet, guys? We'll break this first session. Just stand to your feet with me, if you will. It's not control. It's just yielding to him. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But I'm just encouraging you to. It's just a sign of yielding. I want to pray something unity-wise. I don't usually do this. I don't, I really, Todd knows, I don't usually pray like this, but I feel like I want to pray something after preaching this together and it just seems right to me, so I think you understand. With all your heart, can you not be distracted? Whether you want to close your eyes, you can keep them open, but don't be distracted. I want you to make contact right now in faith to Father God, okay? We're going to pray something together. Will you repeat with me and pray? I don't think it'll be a puppet prayer. I really don't. That's why I don't do that a lot of times. I really believe it'll be a hearty thing. Let's do this together, guys. Say, Father, thank you, you love me. I'm forgiven of every sin. I'm clean in your sight. You absolutely love me. You forgive me. You have great purpose for my life. I'm a son. And I receive sonship. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your eyes. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading and guiding me in truth, in a lifestyle of love. Living from the place of love and revealing your life to the world. It's about you, in me, through me, to others. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Bless you guys.